Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Welcome back to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, everyone. We're glad to have you here. And I love to talk about tax lien certificates and tax defaulted property and tax deeds and so on. But uh, just as importantly, I like to talk about building wealth and building a business. And boy, we're lucky today because we have a, a real entrepreneur on the phone with us, or on the line, I should say. His name is Dave Lucas. I'm not going to stand uh, here and give you a lot of information about him that I'm reading from a long list because he's going to do a better job at that. But you're going to love the name of his podcast. You're just going to love this name. It's called The Misfit Entrepreneur. So, Dave, are you on the line? Can I hear you out there? I am. It's great to be with you and great to be with everybody in the audience. Okay. We're glad to have you and tell us who, about you and the misfit entrepreneur. Oh, geez. Where should I start? So oh, a little we, about uh, you would be a good place, but uh, sure. lifelong entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was five. No joke. My first, uh, that's a good story. I'll tell you guys. When I was five years old, I looked at my mom and told her that I wanted to make some money. And so we came up with this idea for me to make American flags and uh, go sell them to the neighbors. So imagine this little five-year-old gets out the construction paper, spends hours making all these American flags, and then uh, starts down the road in his little red radio flyer wagon and 100% close rate, right? Every door, five, 10 cents a flag, cutest little kid. But it was like taking candy from a baby, as they say, right? Really? I get all the way to the final house on the block. And this is the house that's the darker house. The shades are usually down. You don't see the people out a lot. It's that Uh house. So I muster up the confidence to go to the door and knock on the door. And it seems like an eternity. It was probably like five seconds, but it seemed like an eternity. And this nice little old lady, older lady, answers the door. And I do my little spiel. I'm selling American flags. And deadpan, she looks at me and she goes, no, thank you, honey. We're Canadian. And slams the door in my face. Oh, jeez. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So that was my first lesson in rejection. And so not to be not to be outdone, though, went home, made a Canadian flag, took it back and sold it to her. So. You did not. You went back and made a Canadian flag? Oh, <laughs> yeah. How did you get that idea? Oh, that's I, unbelievable. I said the lady wanted a Canadian flag. So we figured out what that was, made one, and took it back. Oh, but, my goodness. Oh, great so, stuff. Great yeah. stuff. So, so you started young. I've heard about the guys. They all come up with this story about how they were delivering newspapers. You're selling. A lot of people are terrified of selling. I think, it, I, actually, you hear that a lot. People say that a lot. And I disagree with that. I think selling is one of the most innate abilities that we have as human beings. It's yeah. literally every day we're selling. We just don't realize it, right? When you yeah. are sharing an idea with somebody and telling them the benefits of the idea, you're selling them on it. When yeah. you're a guy or a girl trying to get the, other, the guy or the girl to go out with you on a date. You're selling yourself. Yeah, yeah. So it's something that I think is actually just incredibly innate to us as human beings. It's just whether we recognize it or not and really hone that skill in our lives. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think everybody's just afraid of the rejection. I think that's the, the, they feel like they're, they're doing a good job. But when someone says no, uh, we all like yes. Everybody likes yes. But sometimes you have to get about 10 or 15 of those no's before you get the yes. But you earn them. That, that's the thing. You have to grow to get to the yes. And that, I think that's what the challenge yeah, is. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and some of that stems from anybody's heard me speak before has heard me talk about the conditioned mind and how we're conditioned to be who we are. Parents, friends, family, media, religion, all those things shape yeah. us. Nobody comes out of the womb and they say, hey, beautiful baby. Too bad they'll never make more than 35000 It's not like your path is predetermined and set. It, you're shaped in how you think and how you react to things and the responses that you have to things in life. And one of the things that, that happens, and it's I'm guilty of it too. I've got a seven-year-old. We hear a lot of no. We oh. hear no more than we hear yes. And we crave that yes. We crave that, that feeling of acceptance and stuff like that as we grow older. And so we shy away from the no's because we spend our youth hearing it so much and being told it so much, right? So it's a natural thing. But the, uh, the most important thing to understand about that is that every no from a sales aspect gets you closer to a yes. And I think that's yes. important. Exactly, exactly. You mentioned something that you have a, a seven-year-old. Uh, and I read in your bio that uh, so you must have adopted a young lady in, in China. Did you do that? Yeah, Hannah's adopted from China. In fact, I can give the real quick the rest of my story. So, oh, you know, great. went on through through. I, I sold my first business before high school. Went on into direct sales through college. I played football in college. I made something that I could pay for college with and be able to manage around the hectic schedule of all that. Came out of college, took uh, took a company 
to market in Columbus, Ohio. I would say failed pretty miserably. By the end of the uh, first year, I had an income of about $1,000 a month and was working two other jobs to make ends meet. But it was uh, one of the best experiences of my life, learning how to what to do and what not to do in building a business, working with people and all that sort of thing. And so I then spent about six years in the Fortune 500 space and all the while investing in, in trying other things. And that's something that I think is a really important thing for anybody listening from an entrepreneurship standpoint. I think everybody thinks that you just have to burn the boats and go right into entrepreneurship with an idea or whatever. And I, I actually am a big fan of, I think the term's been coined chicken entrepreneurship, right? If you got a job, it's a job's a great base for you to test different things off of and build your business on the side till it gets to where it makes sense. And that's essentially what I did. I invested in a company while I was uh, in the Fortune 500 space and helped guide it and that sort of thing as best I could. And it got big enough to a point where I could leave the Fortune 500 space and, and go full go in it, right? And that company's Grass Technologies and it's an Inc. 5000 five-time company and we do business in about 100 countries nowadays, right? It was, it was a great experience to go through that and then along the way started several hundred other entities and the podcast actually being one of them and the podcast came about when we did adopt Hannah from China, I came home and I had written a book in the about 2009, 2010 timeframe that was a bestseller at the time called The 10-Year Career. And it was about some of the things we're talking about today, things that I had learned on how to put yourself on the fast track from the get-go or get on it if, if you aren't there. And I was fortunate. I got to meet with several billionaires. I got to work directly with people like Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy. And in fact, Brian wrote the cover blurb for the book. And I found my, I found myself uh, with this little one, even at 18 months old, that's about how old she was when we brought her home. All these teachable moments were bubbling up and going back to the conditioning side of thing, as we talked about, I'm right. keenly aware to that. I'm keenly aware that I'm conditioning her from the moment she's in my arms in a way. And so I was amazed at all these scenarios coming up where the, these things would trigger in my mind that I'd seemingly forgotten these wonderful lessons, these amazing pieces of knowledge or advice, even phrases, Zig Ziglar was famous for some of the best, just down home phrases that made sense and made it uh, easy to understand things and things like that. And I said to myself, gosh, there's got to be a way to immortalize this type of information so that uh, Hannah can learn from her daddy and his misfit friends. And that's how it all started. As I thought about it, I, I thought, you know, every entrepreneur is a misfit. You know, wow. if we weren't, we'd all be the same. And, and everybody has is, is got this misfit side to them. And I think, you know, people look at that word in a negative light. And I think it's actually a, an incredibly positive word, right? It's the uniqueness. Yeah. It's the unique genius that everybody has. And so the goal was to set aside a treasure trove of information for Hannah to have when she grows older that hopefully she listens to and uh, takes great things from and helps her in her life. So what did you do? You start recording it? You, mm -hmm. uh, put it? Did you put it somewhere? Where is it? Yeah, it's at misfitentrepreneur.com and on every single medium that podcasts are on. It's a you know big show now. It's 130 countries and 100,000 downloads a month and all that fun stuff. But it's, uh, oh, wonderful. you know. Yeah, yeah, it's really just, you know, I, for me, you talk about like strong whys and stuff. I have my why and it's for her. I do it regardless of anybody listen. So it's yeah. started as a side project, it's turned into its own large business nowadays. It's been, uh, it's been pretty interesting. Wow. Let me ask you a couple of questions that are a little unique probably. Uh, uh, first one is, did you work with Brian Tracy closely or did you work on the side? Did you do anything with him? I, I, I've always admired him. He, he wrote one of the great sales books of so All time it sales books, yeah. No, I, I closely as I think is a relative term. I have played in the sphere with a lot of the people that that he's worked with, people that have done a lot of his right. funnel work and that sort of thing oh. over the years and stuff like that. So yeah. you know, we met through that sort of thing, got to know each other back then. It's been a little while since I've talked to him. He's you know, he's right. gone to do even bigger things now. But during that time, we got somewhat close to where he, he would actually do the cover blur of the book and actually help me with some of the insights for the book and stuff at the time. So well, he must have admired you to do that. So good for. You. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, uh, I just know that uh, most people don't know that he's written some great work on sales, really down to earth uh, kind of thing that the average person could use every day. And uh, his closing I, I was always amazed. Is, his that, closing book is an excellent book. Yeah. And he, some of his chapters were 50 pages. 50 yeah. pages of number four font is a lot of words. And he did some excellent work on that. Yeah, okay, well, that was good. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit about GRASP uh, Technologies, and uh, I'd love to hear a, a little bit more about that, and then 
Maybe we can even talk. A lot of my people like to talk about real estate even, but there's no hard to get to that. We got plenty of time. We can talk about real estate and the stock market, actually, because that's another whole business side that I I own. Grasp, we can cover real quick. We're, it's one of those things that you never know what you're going to get into in the entrepreneur world, right? You think you're going one direction, you end up in another. And so I met the founder of my business partner, Eric Mueller of Grasp, gosh, back in 2004. And at the time, Grasp really was more of a holding company or unique software products for the travel industry around managing data and visualizing data. And in talking to Eric, I could really see the passion that he had and the understanding and experience he had. He'd been in the industry since the late 80s. And so I knew that the products were solid and what he was wanting to do was solid. He just needed help putting, really putting the business around it and needed help from a sales aspect. And I had that background. So we, we basically looked, looked at each other and say, hey, we'll give this a shot and don't know how it'll end up. Let's, let's see how it goes. And so we did that. And we, I invested in the company. I was the only investor ever. We've actually, the whole, whole company since then has been built from cash flow. We don't have any debt or anything. And nice. we built this thing up to be in the largest provider of business intelligence and data management solutions and software for the travel industry at this point. So it's been a, it's been an amazing ride and, and just, it's amazing the people that you get to meet and bring in along the way. I used to be involved in everything in the company as entrepreneurs are in the beginning. And it's amazing how many great people we found to really help this company go to its next levels and continue to. I really, I really believe, and I think anybody listening to this from a business standpoint, if you're trying to build a business or if you have one and you're trying to get to the next level, I will tell you that you're only as good as your weakest link. And what I mean by that is your systems and your infrastructure are very important. And the last thing that most entrepreneurs, especially in fast growing businesses, we grow it over a hundred percent a year for over a decade. And so when you're drinking from a fire hose like that, the last thing you want to do is the little things, right? Documenting this. Do we have a good hiring process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you leave a lot of gaps. You leave a lot of gaps. All those things are, that's the gold, and it's the stuff you don't want to do. And so if I can give you, as as an entrepreneur and business owner, some of the best advice I could ever give you is don't neglect the little things. The little things make the biggest difference. And your systems and your processes are key to you being able to grow and scale. Because if you don't have those dialed in, you can't hand duties off to new people and have them be able to take over, jump in and be able to take things and and run with it. And then the next person and so on. Okay, now hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, I'm gonna gonna hold your feet in the fire here, okay? you're, you're, You're giving us really good advice. Now slow down and give us how you learn that. What should they do to learn that? If they're going to be a good entrepreneur, that's a major undertaking. You, you can't leave out the details. I agree with you. What did you do that they should do? Hi, everyone. I would love to know what you guys think of this week's episode on Imagine Wealth Without Risk. So make sure you leave a rating and a review to let me know. We were forced by necessity. We woke up one day and realized we were two weeks from going out of business from a cash flow standpoint. Oh, Jesus. And we said, how can we grow, be growing at the way that we're growing and everything and be selling all this stuff and everything and be in this position? And it was because we had poor systems. We had poor infrastructure. We had no hiring process. It was like, oh, you want to work for us? Okay, great. Here's the seat over there. Figure it out. And, and, and so for us, we were forced to basically slow down. And so yeah. what we did is we said, we figured out how to get through that hump, that cash yeah. crunch. We you know called clients, took care of things, got payments that were due, all that stuff had to be done. We got through that and then we, we sat down with our team and we basically said, hey, all right, we're gonna purposely slow down. Okay, we're growing at over 100% a year. We slowed down to about a 30% growth a year, which sounds like a lot, but when you slow down from 100 miles an hour to 30, it's a big difference. And you manage, we spent, you manage, you manage. Yeah, we spent 15 months working on every little thing we could find, documenting it, processizing it, testing it, and everything oh, else to get oh it to where it, it was in the right place. And this was about uh, gosh, six, six years ago, but, but it was something that we could have been doing a lot earlier along the way and saved ourselves that headache. And Did you bring in consultants to help you or you just do it, you guys figured it all out yourself? We, no, we had an informal board of oh, people, yeah. former CEOs of companies like that worked with Walmart and stuff like that helped us guide us some. We really, we really figured out a lot of it on our own. A lot of personal growth, a lot of finding books, reading them and stuff like that. And just simplifying too. I think people make things a lot more complicated than they have to be in business and investing and simplifying it and just saying, okay, what are the specific things we need to do? And then eating that elephant one bite at a time. In fact, I interviewed Tom Ziegler on the podcast about a year ago and I asked him, I said, what's the surest path to success? 
And he said, simplest path to success, and this was pretty, for me, this was fairly profound. The simplest path to success was replace a bad habit with a good habit. And if you think about that, I think a lot of people totally overestimate what they can do in a week and underestimate what they can do in a year. And as I thought about, that's exactly what we did. We'd find a bad habit. We'd put the right habit in place, get that solidified, move on to the next one. And over the course of a year, 15 months, we made a dramatic turnaround in the business. Wow. And it's, uh, I think it's the same thing. I think people stare at that whole elephant instead of just the little piece they need to nibble at, get that done, move on to the next one, and so on, right? And yeah. we live in this, the other side of it is the long game. Yeah. We live people, in the- People yeah. tune in and out on these podcasts. Give, a, give us a, how we can contact you and your podcast, and then we'll continue. Sure. Yeah. So you can find me, you can go to the misfitentrepreneur.com. I'm on all of the social media as either Misfit Entrepreneur or Dave Lucas. That's Lucas with a K, L-U-K-A-S. I'm pretty active and you did on- say, You did say the word misfit, right? One word, misfit. Correct. Misfitentrepreneur.com. Okay. You say it so fast, I don't even get it, but that's good. So that, <laughs> I just know you, you're going, you're, uh, your brain's going hundred miles an hour, but your mouth will only go 40 or 50, right? So yes. That's exactly. always true on these. Trying to get as much uh, in for your yeah, audience that's, as that's, I can. Okay, this is really interesting stuff. Right, so you you grow on this business 30, 50, and it's even a mistake. You didn't say that, but I did. To go at 100% a year because you can't keep up with it. Right? Your brain won't keep up. The body won't keep up. And more importantly, you don't have employees to, to help you along. Or well, it's just the, the you, you can grow like that. You just have to have the systems that can keep up with it. Nowadays, we can grow and scale like that. We couldn't back then. We almost well, crushed ourselves. That, that's amazing. And so what do you do other than th- than this business? Do you have a lot of hobbies? Do you have a lot of things that you like to do beside that? I find that people that grow businesses also do lots of other things. What are the other things you do? Yeah, I'm actually a pretty big Ironmaner. So I race Ironmans. And anybody doesn't know what an Ironman is, it's a, probably the world's most grueling one-day race. It's a 2.4-mile swim followed by a 112-mile bike ride followed by a marathon. Whoa. Whoa. I know what it is because I actually lived in Hawaii for a while. They do the west side of the big island. Oh, right. against all that wind. I just can't imagine riding a bike against all that wind. But anyway, yeah. And how long does an does a Ironman, do you call it Ironman race or ma- marathon? What do you call it? No, it's an Ironman, not a marathon, right? It typically, depending on times can vary, right? So like a winner of an Ironman these days is going to be in that eight hour range. Those are the top pros and everybody are going to be in that range. I am not a pro. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the, uh, I'm actually about the top 20% for my age group. So I'm in that, that 12 hour range on a good day, on a bad day, I'm 13 or 14 hours. But uh, for me, each race has uh, got its own uniqueness to it. They're in different places all over the world, different elements, different environments. Sure. And so each time I, I do it, I learn something. The thing I love most about it is not so much the physical aspect, but the mental aspect that it takes. To oh, to go that this. long with that much pain takes a lot of mental. That's for yeah. sure. Wow, yeah. amazing. Wow, wow. And uh, so, and, is and that, I find that helps me in business too, because you can work harder than everybody else. Or you, when you're up against a wall, you built the mental fortitude through doing these other things that that can help you get through it. So you have the strength and the power to continue when others drop out. Mm-hmm. Amazing, amazing. No wonder you've had su- such great success. Again, the uh, title to your podcast. Uh, the Misfit Entrepreneur. Okay, great. Do you invest in real estate? I do. I've been investing for about 20 years. Is? Really? Oh, tell, tell me about that. Yeah, so for me, I am a cash flow buy and hold guy. Oh, how about- I love collecting cash flow and reaping the, especially in real estate, the tax benefits of it. Yeah. And so just started years ago, buying and holding started with, I, I used to, before 2008, before things blew up, I had a, a really good run with, with home builders. I would actually buy their model homes and then lease them back to them. Smart. So you, okay. you guys have seen okay. a, any development always has that model at the front and it's usually a right. really nice home, right? right? Because they put a lot of options and upgrades and stuff into it. And so I would negotiate with the builders to buy that home essentially at a discount because they're just carrying it. They build it at cost. They're just carrying it on the books. So I would buy it at a discount and then I would turn around and rent it back to them at a, at a decent amount that covered all the expenses and put nice profit in my, my pocket. And then when they were done with the neighborhood or done with the model, I'd turn around and sell it. So I'd get a few years uh, of it and then appreciation in it and that sort of thing. After 2008, it's a lot harder to do that. They don't do that as much anymore. But, uh, but so I did that for a while and then got into, uh, nowadays, there's a couple types of investments that I do. 
I do larger investments with groups that are building like apartment complexes and things like that where they're looking for investors to help fund it, but you own a piece of the property as part of your investment based upon the amount that you, you give, basically like a share, if you will, but you're on it just like you would be if you owned property. So you get the tax benefits and everything. And then, you know, when they sell, you get a piece of the profits on that and everything. So I like those. And then fully managed resort property. So not a huge cash flow on the fully managed resort property, but nice appreciation over time. And so I, I look at uh, things like that. So we've got places at ski resorts and okay. uh, different things around the world. I, I completely like what you talked about on, on the second one, the, where you're building value. When you build value is what you do. And that's, uh, that, that's pretty exciting. What did you say the last one was? So the last one's fully managed resort property. Okay, good. I I didn't hear the resort part of it. Okay, good. So, so in both cases, you're building value. That's amazing. Uh, that's really good that you tied into that part of the the real estate market. Uh, mo- most people don't want to do that. If the insurance companies do, and the uh, and the big funds want to do that because th- those are really long term hold though things. So that's but you pretty, reap pretty the uh, you also reap the benefits tax wise and everything from it. We can get into carry over and all that fun stuff if you want to and how that benefits you. No, um, let's not do that because uh, <laughs> they're, they're driving. We don't put everybody to sleep. And, like, the accountants will all stay awake, but the rest of us will go to sleep. But, oh my goodness, talk about whether it's a capital gain or whether it's an ordinary income. Yeah, I, yeah. I get it. Uh, uh, they, can, they can learn that on the next podcast, but this is the, <laughs> we're really doing great stuff here. Let me uh, ask you a couple of questions before we conclude it. And where are you going with this is one. And uh, now that you're really into it, you're a very young man and uh, you've got a great future in front of you. Tell me how you got into it and where are you going with all this? With all this is a big term, right? At this point, we Grass Technologies, we've got a great management team in place. It continues to grow and continues to be able to evolve. And as that does that, I, I don't need to be in that as much. So I put more time into the podcast. I put a lot of time into my trading and investing education business. So I took a lot of what I learned in real estate and applied that to the markets and created a a unique way of investing in the markets that I work with the Raging Bull Group. I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they're one of the top investor education companies. And uh, we've got some solutions through them that uh, I put out and and share. And uh, for me, that's, uh, that's been a lot of fun, helping people attain their financial independence or put them on the path with some unique strategies that they can do that really takes, I guess I've coined the term, less than 10 minutes a day. And for me, that's been a lot of fun. So we've got that. We've got uh, you know, a few other things to continue to look for and, and buy real estate as we go. But uh, we've built the machines around these, and we want to just keep them going. Okay, I get it. So you're just going to keep growing. You're on a growth track, and you want to uh, just keep it doing that. What do you What do you tell starting investors? What do you tell them to start? Do you start? Do they start with rental properties like you did with those those builder homes, or do you, what, what do you think? Starting investors in real estate or starting investors in the market? They're two totally different things. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you clarified that because everybody was so one us to talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm an ex-stock market investor, but I'm a big-time real estate investor. So yeah. could you talk? My title to this is uh, Imagine Wealth Without Risk, and I'm really a tax lien and deed guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been doing that, and I've written books on it and whatever for the past 25 years. So I'm almost your opposite in the sense that I try to teach people – buy it low and sell it low and get the cash, mm-hmm. buy it low so that they can grow because those are the people that are attracted to this. But you have a whole different investment philosophy here. And so I'd love to hear what your recommendations are on real estate investing. So for me, some of the you're talking about some of the same things. There's some very specific rules to real estate, right? So everybody knows locations. You want to be in a good location area. And I'll tell you a great place that is, is to be is I'm in Columbus, Ohio. We have Ohio State University right down in Columbus, right? Franklin so, County. I Franklin know it well. Franklin County, yes. yes There's lots I of good tax well. lien opportunities there. Yes, yeah, that's And funny. what I started out doing, and this may not be for everybody, is I would buy a condo and I would yeah. live in it for a year. Yeah. And then I would rent it. Sure. Right? And then I move on to the next one. And I did that in a, in strategically about uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes from Ohio State. So not on campus. Uh, I don't, you know, that sort of thing. The people that I focused on were the professors or the grad students, young professionals, that sort of thing. So I situated myself in higher and like condo community. They weren't partying members. all the time. I get it. I get it. So that is one, that is the strategy that I use to get off the ground. Now, if oh. you're not in a position to do that, you can still invest in those and, and you make money when you buy, right? So right. you, right. my formula is 110 You look at a hundred properties, 
you narrow it down to 10, you put offers on three, you ultimately buy one. And if you get with a, a good realtor or something like that, you can easily do that. Give them the criteria. You want to buy a dollar for 50 cents or as close to it as you can be. And there's right. always opportunities out there, no matter what type of market there is, as long as you're willing to have the patience for them to come along. Don't invest just to invest. Even though you maybe have capital sitting there that you want to deploy, don't deploy it just to employ it. Deploy it. It's the same thing that investors and traders make in the markets. They got money sitting there and they can't take it. So they throw it in the market and it's not a good time or it's not, they're not following their rules or they're not following the, the right investment strategies and they lose it. So don't trade to trade. Don't invest to invest. Take, be patient. And find that, find the one as you go through it, look at a lot of properties, get to know the area really well, and uh, you'll find that one. And then when you rent it, there's a lot of ways to do it. I use Craigslist, still works great. What I do for every property, what I do for every property is I actually create an own little mini website for it with the amenities and pictures and everything. So it showcases really nice. And then that's what I throw up on uh, Craigslist and people see that and they can actually send us Mm -hmm. a link right through that website that I'm interested in the property and we go from there. Those are a few things that we do that are a little different. Okay. okay. I'm running out of time. I got one minute left. I remind everybody uh, how to get you, go, listen to your podcast and uh, then any final words you like to button it up with. Yeah, absolutely. So you can always listen to The Misfit Entrepreneur across iTunes, across all the different uh, podcast channels, iHeartRadio, all that. Or you can just go to our website, www.misfitentrepreneur.com. Final advice, I think, in some of the most important advice, uh, we have got this concept that we call the Misfit Three. At the end of every episode of the Misfit Entrepreneur, we always phrase it to a guest as if you were going to leave this earth tomorrow, what are the most important pieces of wisdom that you would leave behind for the generations to come after you? And so that's what the Misfit Three are. So my three are, number one, love unconditionally. No matter what happens, forgive and love unconditionally. And it's one of the great things that we have the power to do. Don't let that power go to waste. The second thing is what I call DCP. And DCP stands for discipline, consistency, and persistence. Now you hear those three things and it's duh, right? Those are all yeah. needed to <laughs> succeed, right? Yeah. But what is what do they actually mean? So discipline is doing the things that you know you need to do even when you don't want to do them. Consistency is doing that day in and day out without fail. You can be disciplined for one day, but that's not going to do it for you. You got to do it every day. And even when you do it, and you're disciplined and you're consistent, you're going to hit major barriers, plateaus in your life. And if you're not willing to persist for them, that's where you're going to stay and be stagnant. And that's where you're going to end up and you're not going to be able to go to your next level. So you have to have that fortitude and that will to persist through. So that's the second. And then the third thing I will tell you is that you need to learn from, learn to live from true choice. As I mentioned earlier, we're conditioned in a lot of ways to be who we are. And a lot of the things that we're conditioned with are great. But there are some things, ways that we think, things that we say, things that we do that are automatic responses in our lives that we don't even realize or think about. And they just happen. And they can be debilitating to our success or even our relationships and things like that. And learning to recognize what those things are and then asking yourself if they truly are you or if you want to act a different way or be a different way in those uh, scenarios is one of the greatest personal power exercises you'll ever do for yourself. So learn to live from true choice. Wow. Wow. You're a powerful speaker. Great information. I want to thank you and say your podcast one more time as you leave. Absolutely. And thank you. And thank you to all in the audience for listening. The podcast is The Misfit Entrepreneur. Thank you for joining us today. Go to tedthomas.com to learn how you can start making smart, secure investments today. Be sure to check out the rest of the episode to find out more about Imagine Wealth Without Risk.